Ooh, it's Friday night. All right. Oh, wow. How are you guys doing? Pretty darn We're good. Doing great. Excellent. Uh, I'm Dan Crozier. I'm here <clears throat> with Denver Horror Collective, a fantastic group of writers with uh, Josh Schlossberg. I always mess up your, your name, so uh, yeah, I've good. been practicing. Uh, uh, PL uh, McMillan, Desi D, and uh, Gary. Uh, Ro uh, Roby, almost said Robe. Robe, right. Robe, ah, oh, that's, that's pretty sexy. That's nice. <laughs> cool. Well, uh, thanks for, uh, you know, coming on here, guys, and, uh, you know, being able to, to chat about the book a little bit. Uh, Terror at 5280. Ooh, man. <laughs> So uh, we're going to go through and uh, we're going to, you know, share with the public out there uh, some passages from uh, each of your short stories. Uh, yeah, again, thanks so much for for coming out to, on to this, uh, you know, StreamYard platform and and uh, you know, sharing your craft and uh, you know your talent too. Uh, I'm looking forward to some really spooky uh, stories, but. But first off, you know, Josh and, and, and you know everybody else here. How did uh, this book come about? I don't even remember. I think <laughs> one day we just woke up and decided that we had nothing better to do, and we decided to put a book together. And then stories came in, and it all happened. But really, the story is that we wanted to have a local horror and anthology. We have a lot of great writers in our group, and then there's a lot of great writers across Colorado. And we thought, let's create something that is specifically catered towards those local authors. And all the tales will take place in and around uh, Denver and some of the Rocky Mountain area that we all abide in. So that's the concept. Anyone else have anything to add to that? Yeah, I, I think we approached it as a, uh, as a learning process. And uh, it took off faster than we could ever have imagined. So it was a great... It was a lot of fun actually pulling it off. And yeah, I think we wanted to balance it a little. Everybody knows how beautiful Colorado is. But they didn't know how scary it could be. Mm. That's that's true. There's there's a lot of horror and folk, folklore here in Colorado. I think you guys were able to kind of yeah, build on that, right? That's right. specifically uh, what well, actually, PL, PL all, all of these stories are very true. They're all real. They're all they're all actually none of this is fiction, of course. And PLs is based on some local tales, right? I believe a couple or something like that. Um, yep, yeah, my story is based on Riverdale Road, which is um, slated as the most haunted road in Colorado. So I took two of the urban legends because there's a plethora about that road and I just twisted it into one ghost story. So but yeah, ultimately, this is an anti-tourism product. We're trying to discourage people from coming to Colorado. And we thought if we could frighten them enough, people would stop coming. So we're putting it out there. And people have been buying it. And we got to number two on the Denver Post bestseller list. And we've had a great review in Ginger Nuts of Horror, which is the premier spot for reviewing horror. And it's been getting out there into the world. and. The pandemic is a perfect time for people to read about stuff like this and get more scared, I guess. Yeah, and, and we're hoping with this broadcast that more people will leave Colorado, so. Right, we're not just trying to prevent people from coming, we want <laughs> people to leave, so. <laughs> ah, oh, that's that's awesome. Uh, yeah, for everybody that's, uh, that's interested in purchasing your copy of Terror at 5280, you know, go to their website at denverhorror.com and pick up your, your copy now uh, because supplies are limited. 
They so, are. Everything is limited. Time is limited. Eventually, the sun is going to explode. So we're only here for a short while. So pick up a copy. We're on all the platforms as well. You can go to IndieBound.org and find it in your local bookstore. You can go to Barnes & Noble. Scamazon has it. And we also have it in audio. No, we, we're almost having it in audio. We will soon have it in audio. We have it in ebook and print <coughs> form. And it's actually at a lot of different local stores, bookstores in the Denver area, if stores are even open anymore. I've been up in the mountains for three months. I don't know what's going on in the city anymore. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you're not missing anything. Oh, that's good. It's it's still here. <laughs> Is it? Okay. I can see it once in a while from the mountains. Yeah, I they actually kicked me out of Denver officially. So I'm I'm in the in the mountains in an undisclosed location. Which, Just writing your yeah. heart out, hopefully. I am. I, I have no heart, but yeah, whatever you want to call it. Right. Yeah. At, at the end of the broadcast, they'll uh, they'll broadcast your address for people to contact you directly. Well, I'm I'm equipped with much weaponry. I have a machete, I have a stun gun, and I have a baseball bat. So if you want to take that on, <laughs> let's let's do it. Ah. No, everyone's welcome. I'll talk to you from my balcony. Oh, there. oh that's awesome. All right. Well, uh, Josh, are you ready to share the the first uh, your your story? Uh, I, cold. That's born ready. Okay. I will read a segment from this. I write biological horror, so that's what you're in for. If you don't like that, then you might want to tune out for a little bit. But here it goes. Chronic cold by Josh. I think it's pronounced Schlossberg. Alicia sat shivering on a folding chair at a card table in the middle of the dark, icy alley. The sole street lamp cast a cone of yellow light around her and illuminated the snowflakes hissing down from the sky. Eight-foot snowbanks hemmed her in on both sides as if she were an Olympic athlete about to launch down a gigantic luge track. She yanked off her mittens and checked the weather app on her phone. Eight degrees at 6.09 a.m., snot leaking down her upper lip. From her second stupid head cold in three weeks, she plucked a tissue from the pocket of her parka and angrily blew her nose. Her fingers chilled from the seconds of exposure. She slid them down the front of her snow pants, under her jeans but over her long underwear, to thaw them on her groin. She had to use all her willpower not to be lured back inside to her warm, cozy bed, her bedroom window a snowball's throw away on the second story of her carriage house abutting the alley. But she already paid the 150 bucks for the right-of-way permit to block the alley, and there was no way she was letting that truck speed past again, as it had every goddamn weekday morning since she moved to Denver five months ago, no matter how cold it got. The winter had started off mild with average temperatures in the mid 40s and only a single dusting of snow. But the first week of January unleashed a single digit freeze and negative wind chill that dumped 38 inches on the Denver metro area. By the time residents dug themselves out a few days later, a second brutal storm unloaded two and a half feet more. After yet another three feet the following week, the city council allotted emergency funds for extra plowing to allow passage on side streets and alleys. Still, every two to three days for the next few weeks, anywhere from eight to 20 inches pounded the Mile High City. Embarrassed and slightly defensive weather reporters blamed it on the polar vortex. By mid-February, even ecstatic skiers and snowboarders were praying for the white stuff to stop, with frequent avalanches from upwards of 20 feet in the Rockies forcing resorts to close, two disasters killing a total of six people, while I-70 and other mountain highways shut down on the regular. As a freelancer working from home, Alicia wasn't too inconvenienced by the novelty of a harsh winter, especially with the grocery store a mere 10 minute walk across her trendy West Highland neighborhood. To the contrary, she had hoped the nearly nonstop snow would keep her neighbor from blowing through the alley in his rumbling piece of shit pickup during his customary 610 to 620 a.m. window and let her sleep until her nine o'clock alarm. Happily, the first two storms did effectively block the alley for a week, forcing her neighbor out on the street in the opposite direction, a far more convenient route he had no reason not to take every day, living as he did in the quadruplex on the corner. 
But then the plows came, and despite the ice, he was back to barreling through at the crack of dawn, vibrating her bed and jolting her from a sound sleep to which she was rarely able to return. Though she had never seen the culprit, the beat-up Ford with the native bumper sticker, fishing poles in the gun rack, and the breakneck speed at which he drove gave her a pretty good idea of what he probably looked like a scruffy, stocky, ZZ Top listening plumber type in a baseball cap and Carhartt jacket, perhaps a bit younger than her 35 years. Today was the day she would find out for sure when she made him promise to either slow down or avoid the alley altogether. And if he said no, well then, she'd simply refuse to let him pass. Sure enough, a rhythmic scratching from his end of the alley as of someone scraping ice off a windshield. As the crunching got nearer, her belly fluttered when she realized there were footsteps. Had he finally accepted how inconsiderate he had been all those months and was coming over to apologize? Or was he planning to bludgeon her with a wrench? As she squinted into the darkness, a massive figure emerged from the shadows. Walking on all fours and no less than five feet high at the shoulders, it appeared to be a small horse. Had someone gone for a ride across Denver's Arctic tundra and fallen off? But as it got closer, its colossal rack of antlers proved it to be the biggest deer she had ever seen. No, check that, an elk. Even recent transplants such as herself were familiar with the majestic creatures grazing the meadows outside Evergreen or foraging by the road in Rocky Mountain National Park. She recalled recent news reports about desperate deer, elk, and even moose escaping the snow-choked mountains down to the front range communities of Boulder. Boulder, Arvada, and Golden in hopes of finding something to eat. Trudging along with its head hanging down, its rib cage and bony haunches protruding from its pelt like a scaffolding draped with a blanket, it certainly appeared to be starving. But what made her toes curl inside her boots were the dozens of barnacle-like black growths sprouting all over its body, ranging in diameter from grapes to navel oranges, including a fist-sized one on the side of its snout like a blind, misplaced eye. She had never heard of elk attacking people, but if anything that big got spooked, despite its emaciated state, it had to weigh at least 500 pounds, it could do some real damage. And something about those warts or tumors made her feel like puking. She thumped her mittens together to get its attention, but either it didn't hear or ignored the sound and kept plodding towards her. Heart racing, she bit off one mitten, tore off the other, and clapped her hands once, twice, and again until it came to a shambling stop about 20 feet away. Lifting its huge head to peer at her with black eyes, it snorted a cloud of vapor into the air. Greeting her threat, Alicia was unsure. Seconds later, it lowered its head again and kept walking, its antlers jutting out like broken chandeliers. Her thighs tensed involuntarily, telling her to get the hell out of there. If she made a break for it, she knew she could reach her back door in five seconds flat. Of course, the moment she set foot inside, her friggin' neighbor would come hurtling down the alley and she'd have to wake up the next morning to do the whole thing over again. No, she wasn't about to abandon her post because of some harmless, albeit disgusting, grass muncher. Not after all the bullshit she'd been through. When she had moved from small town Missouri into the carriage house on the alley, the only place she could afford in rapidly gentrifying northwest Denver, she knew she'd have to put up with inconveniences like garbage trucks and the hammers, bud saws, and boom boxes from near constant construction. If the street on which she lived, lined with manicured lawns and brightly painted house fronts, was the pretty face of her block, the unkept litter strewn alley was its unwiped ass crack. So the first time she was torn from sleep just after six o'clock by the roar and rumble of a passing vehicle, she assumed it was a fluke and drifted off again. But after two weeks of the same, she bought a box fan, hoping the white noise would drown out the sound. No such luck as the speeding machine actually shook the building like a miniature earthquake. Then she bought vibration absorbing rubber pads to stick under the legs of her bed frame. Unfortunately, they did nothing. Furious at the routine interruption of her REM cycle, she found it harder and harder to get back to sleep. After all, other vehicles undoubtedly passed through in the morning without waking her. So what made this a-hole drive like the devil was after him? After another few weeks of unwelcome wake-up calls, she knew she had two choices. Address the situation or move out. The next morning, she rose with the sun to peer sleepily from her bedroom window until a beige ramshackle pickup truck whizzed by. 
Though the angle prevented her from seeing the driver, she recognized the rusty beater from the quadruplex on the corner. That night, she stuck a polite note under its windshield wiper, asking the owner to please slow down or consider exiting via the adjacent street and left her name and address. The next morning, she was ripped from a blissful flying dream by the truck's grumbling passage. Despite her outrage, she decided to be a good neighbor and give them another couple of weeks to knock it off. When two more weeks came and went without even the slightest reduction in speed or noise, she figured they must not have seen the note because it had fallen out from under the wiper and left an identical one. Sleep stealing business as usual from the mystery driver for yet another two weeks. Frazzled and exhausted, she left a third note, this one reminding the person they were breaking the 15 miles per hour alley speed limit. If they didn't change their behavior, she'd have no choice but to report them to police. Later that day, she found the note wedged into her back door. On the other side, someone had written in sloppy capital letters, stop putting notes on my truck. Life starts for most at 6 a.m. Any other questions, you can come talk to me in person. It was signed Reg, and he had scrawled, scrawled his address in apartment number three. She was floored by how a simple request from one neighbor to another had turned into such an ordeal. It wasn't like she was asking him to serve her breakfast in bed. Still, if he wanted to talk face to face, it was a good sign he was open to reason. Just after sunset, hopeful and a bit nervous, she walked over to the quadruplex and knocked on apartment three. The squeaks, whistles, and chatter of a basketball game in the background, the stink of cat piss wafting out from under the door. When no one answered, she knocked again to no response. Confused, she hurried back to the carriage house for pen and paper and returned to the quadruplex. The basketball game had been shut off, replaced by an eerie silence from inside, and she knocked tentatively. Then louder, nothing. Annoyed, she scribbled a quick note with her phone number saying she had stopped by, stuck it in the door, and walked home. Twenty minutes later, she got a text. So what's wrong with my driving now? I'm still just asking you to please slow down or take the other way out of the alley in the morning, she replied, following up with a smiley face despite her frustration. I'm not speeding. Seriously, who did this schmuck think he was? But you are, she texted, pacing around her tiny kitchen. I don't want to involve police, but I will if I have to. I've already contacted police and they told me I have enough evidence for a restraining order for harassment. She forced a spiteful laugh at the absurdity of the perpetrator framing himself as the victim. We both know that's not the case. Livid, her hands trembled as she typed, I'm simply asking you to take your foot off the gas for three seconds. I've been driving down this alley for 19 years with no problems. I'm not about to change for some out-of-state busybody. Do not text my phone again. Every muscle in her body taut. Alicia immediately called Denver Police Department's non-emergency number. The dispatcher connected her to Officer Bob Gibson, who listened politely as she explained the situation, and he promised to pay her neighbor a visit. Satisfied things were finally under control, she felt the tension melt away from her shoulders. When she was awoken by the prick the next five days in a row, she merely smiled, knowing his days were numbered. Now the DPD was on the case. However, after another Monday of vehicular thunder, her confidence began to fade. And when Friday dawn rolled around with the same old bullshit, she called Officer Gibson, he apologizing, saying how busy he'd been, but assuring her he'd get to it that weekend. If anything, the truck's sonic boom was louder that Monday morning. With a shriek of fury, she picked up the phone and dialed Gibson's number yet again. This is Alicia in the carriage house, she said through clenched teeth, a barely audible sigh from the other end. How can I help you? You have any idea when you might be going over there? She said as calmly as she could, her neck muscles straining to keep in her ire. I contacted the individual on Tuesday, he said. And they said they weren't speeding. But they are, Alicia's voice shook. Every day for five months. I'm afraid it's a he said, she said situation. Then send a fucking patrol car out here and catch him in the act. Ma'am, we can't prioritize. Then what good are you? She hung up the phone. For a full month, she plotted and planned, concocting and discarding various schemes, including letting the air out of his tires, scattering nails in his parking space, and pouring gallons of rubber cement in the middle of the alley. Of course, if anything out of the ordinary happened, she'd be the obvious and only suspect. Instead, she settled on driving to the hardware store 
and buying a two-foot-high fluorescent yellow plastic boy that read slow across its torso, which she placed in her parking spot behind her Subaru at the edge of the alley. The next morning, she was somehow unsurprised to find the little boy lying on its side, its body warped and mangled from what appeared to be a trampling. Fuming, she set it up again, this time jutting a foot or so into the alley. The next morning, it was gone. At her wit's end, she was in the middle of researching which substances you can pour into gas tanks to keep vehicles from starting when she heard laughter from the alley. She ran over to the window and yanked up the blinds. Three houses away, a pair of landscapers in overalls sat on the tailgate of their flatbed eating sandwiches, their truck completely blocking the alley as if it were parked in their own private driveway. She slid open the window, yelled, fuck you, and slammed it shut again. Cracking her knuckles, she called Denver 311, who connected her to the right-of-way department where she left a message for the inspector. An hour later, the inspector called back and explained how the landscapers had secured a permit to legally obstruct the alley. Gaping, she knew she had her answer. Right after hanging up, she logged on to denvergov.gov and applied for a permit to block the alley for the following work week. That Friday, she received an email from the city saying her application had been accepted along with a $150 bill. She gladly paid via her credit card and triumphantly printed out her permit. Sadly, the elk didn't care a lick for Alicia's permit and lumbered onward, a thin layer of snow glazing its rickety back. Hey, she yelled, blowing a snot bubble from one nostril. Look up, you idiot. The creature came to a halt. Lifting its head from the end of its long brontosaurus-like neck, it opened its mouth and let out a shrill, squeaking whinny, almost like a whale song that lasted several seconds. Her heart drubbing in her throat, she slowly backed away from the table as it lurched forward again, blocking any escape to her back door. She had put about 10 feet between them when it waltzed up to the table and knocked it aside like the flimsy piece of plastic it was. She hadn't seen it run, but knew that even in its degraded condition, it could easily chase her down. So she flung herself against a snowbank and attempted to climb to the top. Her toes lost purchase twice, but digging her bare fingers into the crunchy snow, she scrabbled up to safety. Out of reach now, she gazed in fascination as the beast broke into a trot and head down rammed its antlers into the snowbank, then backed up and did it again. Since Alicia posed no threat to the giant and had no young to protect, it was clear the poor thing had gone mad with starvation. Instead, it kept slamming its head into the snowbank four times, five times, six, until something shifted beneath her and everything went slow motion. With one final headbutt from the elk, the snow gave out from under her feet. She tumbled through the air and a sloppy cannonball landed in the alley with a lightning strike on her right knee and fell flat on her face on the ice. For the rest of it, you'll have to purchase Terror at 5280. Oh, thank you so much, Josh. That was fantastic. Thank you. Oh, appreciate it. And it looks like we're, we're joined by Jameis. How you doing? I'm doing good. I'm doing better. Yeah. I'm doing better now that I'm here. So, <laughs> excellent. Well, thanks for for joining us on here. Uh, next up, we've got uh, El McMillan, uh, and uh, she'll be reading uh, "Left Behind." That's right. Um, yeah. So I'm P.L. McMillan. I write cosmic and gothic horror. If uh, you end up liking my story, you should buy the book, for one. And you can visit me at my website at plmcmillan.com. So, left behind. The tires of my sedan hum on the road as it ribbons onward into the heavy night. Riverdale Road is sparse in the way of streetlights and fellow travelers. It's a lonely stretch. A few houses have been built on the west side, while shadow, shadowed fields on the east give credit to the eerie legends I'd read about it. Roads like these are the bread and butter of America's ghostly roadmap. I smile a bit to myself. I should make sure to remember that and add it to my scrapbook. I glance over at my boyfriend, Alan, who is entranced at whatever it is he has pulled up on his phone. He's not the ghost ch chaser type, but he loves me enough to come along on my adventures. You can pull up anywhere around here, Claire. Zora says from the back seat. What about the gates, I ask. 
Zora's boyfriend, Ross, chuckles a bit, causing the familiar bright flicker of anxiety to nip at me. Did I say something wrong? Well, the gates of hell don't actually exist anymore, Zora says. This place has pretty much all changed since that guy killed his wife. I mean, there was no reason to keep them up after the guy burned his own house to the ground. The gates were just these little rusty things, from what I hear. Nothing to write home about. Really, she goes on, it seems like supernatural activity happens anywhere along the length of this road. So this should be good enough. Look, there's a mile marker right there. Maybe we'll see one of those bloody handprints that are supposed to appear on all the road signs. To my left, distant house lights twinkle, a vague reminder of civilization. I activate my turning signal, despite there being no one else on the road, and pull onto the dirt. I turn off the car, and the four of us sit there in the shadowed interior of my sedan. I feel a momentary flutter in my belly, wishing I'd come here with only Alan. We just moved here for Alan's work. I was working odd jobs and being introverted myself, Alan kept saying we needed to get out more, make friends. So here I was trying to make friends. I take a deep breath and open my door. After a moment, the other three pass passengers do the same and the four of us step out into the night. Summer's warm touch is still present in the small breeze that sends the field grass whispering. Alan yawns and stretches his arms. Want me to grab the bag? He asks and starts to the back of the car without waiting for my answer. I take a second to gaze out at the field where supposedly a man went mad and murdered his wife and children. The familiar thrill of fear rolls down my body and I savor it. Getting the creeps from a ghost story is preferable to the daily anxieties I feel in my life. Everyone got their flashlight? Ross asks. I don't know either of them very well and that puts me on edge. Alan met Zora through work and had mentioned to her that I loved urban legends and haunted houses. She had told him about the cursed stretch of road near Thornton called Riverdale. Next thing I knew, we were going on double dates. Zora was all right, carefree, if a bit arrogant, but Ross was not the type of guy I usually make friends with. Still, Alan wanted me to try, try and make friends. Well, let's go and bust some ghosts. Alan has pulled out the little backpack I brought and tosses me the camera. The plastic equipment smarts as it hits my hands. It's my clunky Polaroid camera that I'd gotten at a secondhand shop. One of my favorite things to try to do is try and capture things on film. People will always claim it's fake if it's digital, so I only ever use Polaroids. Plus, it makes for good scrapbook material. Can't help but smile, and Alan gives me a wink. I toss him the car keys, which he catches easily. Keep that in the backpack, okay? I wouldn't want to lose it and have us trapped here uh, with the ghosties, I laugh. I lead the way off the dirt of the breakdown lane and into the thick grass. To keep my hands free, I have a headlamp on. A wooden fence guards the side of the fence uh, field and runs parallel along the road for as far as I can see. I climb over, placing my hands gingerly to avoid splinters. Zora, you said you've been here before, right? I say, feeling responsible to make sure everyone is having fun and feeling entertained because this is my hobby and they are only here because they were asked to come. Yeah, but I didn't see anything, not a single devious jogger, bloody handed boy or lady in white either. Really Claire, I don't know why you find all this dumb shit so fun, she says with a laugh. I heard that the lady everyone sees at the side of the road is the ghost of the man's wife looking for her children or maybe her husband for revenge, Ross says, punctuating the last word with a theatrical cackle. I feel like if the city bothered to add more streetlights along the road, then no one would be seeing these ghoulies anymore, Alan said. People watch too many horror movies. We should have come on a full moon, Ross says. Then maybe we could have seen a werewolf too. I tell myself it doesn't matter that they think I'm silly for wanting to believe in this kind of stuff. Ahead of me, the field stretches on and disappears into a dark void. The moon is covered in thick clouds, so the only true light is from the flashlights, which sweep in savage beams across the grass and weeds. I've walked farther ahead than the others, trying to find that same delicious shiver, that same sense of foreboding I had before, but the others are laughing and talking too loudly. Any sense of atmosphere has been smashed to bits. You know, Zora says, maybe we'll see that old madman after all. From the version I heard, his wife was blonde. Maybe he'll think you're his wife come home and come out for a nice big kiss. And again, if you want to read more. 
you can get it on Amazon. Uh, thanks so much, PL. I, yeah, that was fantastic. Oh, man. Thank you. <laughs> yes, make sure uh, everybody that's watching out there, go to denverhorror.com and purchase your copy. Uh, these uh, talented folks are working on uh, their next book. Uh, Josh, can you talk a little bit about that? I can. I don't have my earbuds in, but I'm going to talk anyway. Oh, that's fine. Sorry to put you on the spot. No, I like being put on the spot. So we have a book, an anthology called Consumed Tales Inspired by the Wendigo that we are in the process of getting. The deadline is coming up in the next two weeks. You can go to denverhorror.com and find the open call for submissions. And the editors are Holly and Henry Snyder of Strigiday Publishing. We have some big names involved with it. We have Owl Going Back. We have Steve Tam. We have Rath James White. And we have Dana Fredsty as well and many other folks. We're going to have some folks from Denver Horror Collective or something. We have folks from around the country and the world, I believe, submitting as well. If you want to support it or... If you're more into just getting presents, you can go to our Indiegogo, and that's also EndeavorHorror.com, and you can provide certain amounts of money, and we'll give you certain amounts of presents. So for 20 bucks, you can get an advanced copy of the book, which is definitely not out yet, but you'll get it before other people do. And there are all sorts of other fun prizes, such as, PL, what's, what's your prize that you're offering? Um, so I volunteered to make a Wendigo cross stitch, which will be framed. So you can have that in uh, your house or apartment to uh, show you're a big supporter of indie writers and cannibalism. <laughs> if you want to see the exact design, I did make a concept uh, art piece. Uh, which is on the Indiegogo site. So you can see what it is, of course, before you uh, decide to pick that as your prize. But I'd pick it. I mean, I'm not biased at all, but I would pick it. We have lots of great prizes there. And so you're supporting indie, indie publishing, which is super important. And I seem to have lost the screen. I can't find anyone now, but uh, oh, there you guys are. So yeah, DenverHorror.com, you can find out about that. If you are interested in submitting, there's still time. If you want to just get an advance, you want to support it, or you can just wait and get it later when people return it to the bookstore. <laughs> oh, that, that's fantastic. Uh, thanks so much, Josh and PL. Um, so moving right along, we've got uh, Desi D and uh, her short story, if I shall wait. <laughs> Hi. Uh, I'm Desi D. I write fantasy horror. It's a little bit of a thriller flavor to it. Um, you can find me on Facebook as Desi D. Writer or my website, DesiDWriter.com. And if I shall wake. The pain in my chest spiked. It had been progressively getting worse despite the fact I'd been taking those damn horse pills every single day. All the doctors agreed. I needed a new heart. And soon. I should be taking it easy, avoiding stress while coming up with $1.4 million for the transport before my pump, old pump gave out. My fucking insurance determined this was a pre-existing condition. Their CEOs behind the decision were lucky. My focus had to be on earning money for my new heart. However, once I got my transplant, I planned on fitting each of those bastards with a body bag because of their pre-existing conditions of being assholes. I only needed to complete this final job to afford my new ticker. I waited for my target, Joanna, outside of the Falling Rock Tap House on 19th and Blake Street. I had a clear view of her from my table on the patio. The buildings on each side of me blocked the breeze, allowing the juicy burger scent to fill the air. My fries were crispy, just how I liked them. The place was packed for a Tuesday night, and still, I was alone, invisible to those around me. 
consumed with their drinks and conversations. Denver, Colorado is an interesting town. When I landed at DIA, it looked empty <clears throat> like another small hick town. Then I reached downtown where it transformed into a big city surrounded by a panoramic view of the mountains and blue skies. It wasn't overly crowded like LA or New York. There was a calming atmosphere I enjoyed. Even now, I could almost see a star or two in the night sky. I might have to come back here after a oh, sharp pain constricted in my chest. I clutched my jaws until it passed. The thin air from being at the mile high probably wasn't helping. The doctors had warned me not to overwork myself. This job should have been easy. It should have been finished in Phoenix last week. I had followed Joanna for a couple of days attempting to learn her routine, but she didn't have one. She never did the same thing twice. She visited a few office buildings, took a couple of meetings at local restaurants or coffee shops. Usually, this wouldn't have been a problem. And it wasn't surprising since she was a consultant who never seemed to sit still. My employer, Phantom Inc. Corporation, didn't specifically what type of work she did or why they wanted her dead. And I didn't ask. I'd done a few jobs for them in the past. They paid well. And with my ticker threatening to give out, that was all I needed to know. Although... I figured she'd seen or overheard something she shouldn't have, and now was a loose end. It was difficult to slip poison into her drink at a cafe in Phoenix. I just walked by, dropping a small tablet into her cup when she looked away. She never even noticed me. I don't stand out. I'm of average height and build. I keep my brown hair short, neat, unimpressive. I don't have any tattoos or wear anything that might get me noticed. This job should have been over then. However, she didn't touch her nearly full coffee. It's possible she just bought it to be social. From there, I followed her to the humid sweathouse state of Texas. This time, I placed the poison onto the door handle of her rental car. I don't underestimate, I don't understand how she managed to avoid it. I was sure I hadn't missed a spot. So now here I was in Denver waiting for another opportunity. I preferred to poison my victims because I didn't use just any toxins. I made my own untraceable, fast acting and painless blends. I may be a killer for hire, but I never made anyone suffer. I'd seen enough of that as a child. Joanna stood at the bar less than 20 feet from me with a strained grip on her glass as if it was going to try and escape while she spoke to the bartender. It wouldn't be easy to slip anything into her drink this time. I could only see the side of her face, but she looked determined. Her long, dark braid swung with each of her words. The bartender shook his head slowly. His thin, graying ponytail brushed against the glass he had been drying for the last few minutes. The shiny bald spot on top of his head reflected the hanging lights. He was built like a boxer, an expression of concern behind his thick black framed glasses. From their body language, this was not just another meeting. They knew each other. Plus, he had been ignoring the other customers trying to get his attention, leaving their service to a scrawny bartender who didn't look happy about it. He took a deep breath, setting the polished glass down, then pulled something from his pocket, slid it to her like an illegal drug. However, I'd never seen drugs passed in a worn, dingy, ancient-looking cloth. Joanna closed her fist around the thing, and the bartender gently placed his hand over hers, leaning into her as he spoke. She released her glass, shaking her head before pulling her hand free. She clenched the shaggy rag like it held the secret of life itself. A small light started to shimmer through her fingertips. I rubbed my eyes. They had been playing tricks on me. The pressure in my chest spiked. I looked down at my fries while I resisted the urge to grab my breast. The pain never lasted long. This, I was too damn close to getting paid to stop now, and I had already survived far worse. I would get my transports before this worthless pump killed me.
I hadn't been born a killer. I was made into one. Something I made my uncle regret. This His farm is still known to this day as the butcher's farm. He didn't have conventional livestock. I survived when other kids didn't because I wasn't willing to accept my fate. I did what I had to to survive. For years, it was them or me. I always chose me, and that meant cooperating, being a killer. I was family, so that was why I got the option to assist instead of being only a victim. I did my part and developed a talent for it. I never enjoyed the killing, but when the opportunity arose, I took it, and my aunt took a knife to the back. I was 12. This pump in my rib cage was just the most recent thing that wanted me dead. Well, screw it, too. The pain receded. That looked painful, Joanna said. Hey, Desi, your mic just uh, stopped working. Okay, well, that seems like a good spot to stop then. <laughs> <laughs> you want to read more? Get Tara at 52. <laughs> I build up the tension. I love it. <laughs> uh, thanks so much, Desi. Uh, that that was a pretty uh, you know <laughs> unique way to end it. <laughs> oh, thank you so much, guys. And uh, we've got now uh, Gary Roby, uh, and he's going to be reading uh, a section of his uh, short story. Scrape. I'm Gary Roby, also known as Gary Robey. <laughs> uh, the story is Scrape. Uh, I'm gonna, I'll start now. An ever-present fog surrounds the house. I press my face and hands against the cool glass of the bedroom window, trying to see if there's any movement or sign of life within any holes in the fog. Disjointed memories flash inside my head. I have no control over them when they come or how long they last. I don't know which ones are real or not. The house is being scraped. Mom, Dad, Rachel and me standing by the curb on Downing Street, watching the bulldozer close in for the first ceremonial punch to the bricks and wood structure. I like the old two, I like the old two story house. It has many rooms, nooks and crannies, places to explore and hide, overwhelming smells of must and cake dust hints of decay. It is, it is extraordinarily empty, a perfect place for an 11-year-old boy. But mom and dad have other ideas. This house will come down and a new house will go up. They only bought the place for the desirable land in a desirable neighborhood. It's a hot summer day, no clouds in the sky, and although there are many trees on the street, all the ones in our property have already been taken down. The sun gleams off the yellow tractor until a bloom of black smoke covers it. Dad coughs. Mom laughs. Rachel picks dandelions. I turn my attention to the house. The reflection of a dark cloud crosses the second story window, but it's not a cloud. Something is moving inside the house. I glance around just to be sure. No planes, birds, giant insects, nothing. Maybe it's an optical illusion or possibly a couple of workers doing last minute preps inside before the bulldozer makes contact. I return to the window and I see a figure, no figures in the window. The figures are small, children I guess, and I can barely make out faces resembling a boy and a girl. Standing behind the window with the light hitting it makes them seem transparent, unreal. The boy raises raises his hand. I scream. That catches the attention of dad who quickly motions for the bulldozer to stop. I shout over the rumbling, idling engine. There's somebody in there. Then point to where I can still see the vague but undeniably human faces behind the glare streaking across the window. Dad looks that way and squints. I don't see anything, he says. He walks to the bulldozer where several workers mill about says something to them, and all of them go into the house. I keep my eyes on the window until Dad appears, waving with a big grin on his face. Of course, the house is dead empty. 
Six months later, we are in the new house, a two-story box with transplanted trees and a rooftop deck. I can't remember a thing about the construction. We are simply there, inside, looking out new windows with the stickers still on them. All the furniture is new. It smells like a new house. But that memory of the new house is brief, a tease. I scratch the peeling window frame and wait for more holes in the fog to appear. Dad screams downstairs. He has found mom. He knows he is the one who stuffed her in the fireplace, a window of sanity open for only a few moments, long enough for him to anguish and tear into his eyes and pound up the stairs to look for Rachel and me. He won't come into our rooms. He can't come into our rooms. The house stops him from that. Is this happening now or is this just another two real memory slice? I close my eyes. I see dad beneath the kitchen table, his head bashed in, mom sitting down calm as can be with an empty cup before her as if she is pretending to have tea. A broken baseball bat on the floor next to her. When she looks up at us with those eyes that don't belong to her, Rachel and I run up the stairs to our rooms. Eyes closed or open, it doesn't matter. When a dream memory comes, I am there and it is real, however discordant or wrong it may seem. I imagine time means nothing. I imagine there are multiple versions of me across all kinds of planes of existence and that everything I remember or dream did happen. I've thought about this stuff. I am 12, I am 35, I am dead, I was never alive. Did I grow up in the new house, leave for college, meet a sweet girl I fell in love with, marry and have kids, two of them, Delilah and Matthew? I have memories of those things, but I've never left this house never once made it past the desolate yard in the fog that surrounds us. Every now and then when I stand at the window, I see glimpses of what might be the real world in the holes of the fog. And in between the memories, I think there is a chance to escape and maybe meet the me on the other side. The first night in the new house, everyone is excited, especially dad, who sees this as his finished project. Mom is everywhere at once, smiling and dancing and singing like she is on a honeymoon cruise. Mom opens my closet door a dozen times. I can't believe how much room you have in here, she says. It's not that big, I say. It's just a normal step in, step, step in, step out closet with a bar to hang clothes and a couple of wire shelves. Mom makes a big deal out of everything. Then she disappears into the closet, closing the door. The room becomes very quiet as if she stepped into another world. She pops out like she is playing Jack in the Box, entertaining a two-year-old. Mom, stop. I'm not a baby. Later, I look in the closet. It seems even smaller than I remembered. I can't figure out how Mom, who's a big woman, would even, could even fit in it. There's a musty smell, too, something I hadn't noticed before. It reminds me of the original house that had been scraped to make room for this one. I step inside. Nothing strange. Boxes stacked to my chin, a few shirts and pants hanging on the wooden rod. Wait, the rod is supposed to be metal, not wood, and the wire shelves are gone, replaced by well-worn wood ones. This is the closet I popped into before the house was scraped. The house that is gone, gone. The door swings shut, everything is pitch black. Damn it, Rachel, I yell. I push the door, but something pushes back, something stronger than me. Mom, Dad, whoever it is stays silent. Then a faint scratching, starting at the bottom of the door, moving upward and getting louder. The scratching grows in intensity as whatever it is digs its nails into the wood of the door. I back away, expecting to stumble into the boxes. I don't. I swing my arms around in panic. It's not a closet anymore. Whatever I am in is immense. My voice echoes as if I'm in a deep cavern. I run, but I'm not sure I'm running. I can't see, and I can't feel my feet strike the floor. There is no memory of getting out. And that's where I'll stop. So if you want to find out what happens, here's the book. I can find it there. Oh, thank you so much, Gary. That was wonderful. Uh, we've got time for uh, Jameis Wilkins, who uh, just joined us. How are you doing, Jameis? <clears throat> I'm doing great. Um, I got caught up in Gary's story again, so I think I'm gonna. I think I'm just gonna read the rest oh, of Gary's yeah. story. Oh yeah, yeah. So did I. Uh, I'm just kidding. Do you have a, a selection to, to read for us tonight? 
I do. I'm going to read to you from that time Maggie ghosted me. Uh, it's my contribution to Tarot 5280, and I'm going to be reading it from my Kindle Cloud Reader because you can also get a digital copy of it on Amazon. They thought of everything. So, all right. That Time Maggie Ghosted Me by Jameis Wilkes. I was about to delete the Yes No Dating app on my phone when I saw its icon had a little red dot with the number eight resting on it. Eight Yes No inbox messages, as in eight more than what I had when I checked two weeks ago on a drunk Friday night. I flushed a little bit. Pulse rising, I checked myself. She hasn't messaged you or said boo in three weeks, man. Leave it alone. You always get caught up in this shit only to be crushed because you ruin it with over-communicating. Don't. I tap the yes, no apps icon. The YK inbox's eight messages had five from Magistra 83. Maggie. 15 years my junior and six inches taller than me, Maggie was intrigued by my profile interested in exchanging messages with me and made the first move on yes, no. It took a lot of shit from my sister Rossi, the realtor, in regard to Maggie's age, and I had my own misgivings about it. These misgivings revolved around how it seemed the general public, especially females, react to old men dating young women. This reaction involves an apoplectic eye roll and an exclamation falling somewhere between the sarcastic, of course, and the blunt, disgusting. I got over this exaggerated in my mind obstacle after an initial flurry of exchanged messages over four days with Maggie. This flurry revealed her to be intelligent, funny, and the best of challenges where we didn't see eye to eye. We graduated using Yes No's glitchy YK video chat. That's when I became smitten, or at least infatuated. When we chatted, for half an hour or more every night for weeks, either by video or texting. She loved talking heads but hated kiss. Huge points on the first, and I decided to not subtract points on the second. Maggie's smile was wide, and her shoulder-length chestnut hair was prone to going wild with very little laughter. She liked my smirk, was tickled that I played xylophone in high school marching band, and thought my earring was badass. We both like the horror genre quite a bit, including its wide and varied offerings in film, books, TV, and such. Stephen King was her favorite mainstream horror novelist, and some guy I never heard of named Ryman Northmark was her favorite indie horror tale spinner. She hated people making tall person comments or jokes, especially ones directed at her. She checked, double checked, and checked yet again with me if that if we ever met, I would be okay being seen with a woman half a foot taller than me. Her parents lived somewhere near Cape Cod, which explained the Boston layer in her speech, especially when she got excited about something, and said my voice was metropolitan and thigh-shivering deep. She moved to Colorado to go to school on a scholarship, ended up staying, and currently lived close to downtown Denver. She loved haunting coffee shops, comedy clubs, delis, poetry slams, used clothing stores, improv, and open mic nights. She dug that I was an artist, half dug that my day job was in the shipping and receiving logistics, and she appeared genuinely interested in my artwork. She even gave what seemed to be glowing and sincere compliments of my pen and ink pieces. The jigsaw puzzles, true crime books, and criminal justice reference volumes that populated the bookcase behind me in the limited view my webcam provided, told her I had sweet smarts. And when I repeated her but said street smarts, she corrected me back to sweet smarts. Maggie often had Maggie often had cello music playing in the background, texted intelligently with minimal abbreviations, and had an undergraduate degree in social work. Her day job was a mystery but I was fine with her withholding any info she wanted to until she felt safe to share it. I'd learned my lesson in that regard when I was regrettably pushy on details from other yes-no parties. So, 
I didn't push at all for her to give up a Facebook profile, phone number, or email address. And we just let things ride in the safety of yes, no's communication platforms. We exchanged dating and relationship horror stories and had sort of an unspoken agreement that she'd let me know when we should do the meet for coffee thing. She seemed not only bothered by, but relishing our age difference, me being 50 and her 35. One night in a YK video chat session, I made what I thought was a harmless crack about being a daddy to her because of my age. Her response was very sober. That's bordering on being an insulting thing to say, Paul. My tail was between my legs. She continued, look, we haven't been friends that long and well, but surely you think of me more than that. I think she saw in my stuttering apology and wilted look that I regretted the daddy comment and she shifted gears in a manner that made my blood run its warmest since we began communicating. She moved a short strand of hair away from her face and smiled at me while looking directly at the camera eye, her eyes appearing to meet mine. I'm not a girl, Paul. I'm a woman who wants to meet you. And I think we should possibly hint, stop, for it. The video chat glitched and broke up Maggie's voice at first, then fractured her image into pixelated scrambles and digital distortion. Fuck, I responded. It's breaking up again, Maggie. Look, I'll uh, I'll get on the chat and we can chat. But she messaged my phone first. Magistra 83. The timing on this video thing is for shit. X poly X. I know. Christ, how many times has this happened? Magistra 83. Too many. I was trying to tell you I'm down for meeting somewhere this Thursday or Friday night if you want, if your schedule allows. Something low key. I probably overdid my fist pump as I nearly dropped my phone. X poly X. Uh, that sounds awesome. I'd love to see you. Magistra 83. Cool. There's a bookstore. The rippling ellipsis that represents the other party still in process of messaging had shown for a short bit, but then it went away. Bookstore was the last word I'd gotten from her for weeks. When I did hear from her again, the circumstances were significantly different. Until that time, the passage of days was mind bending and dark. And that's it. If you want the rest, you got to buy the book, Tear It 5280. Uh, thanks so much, Jameis. Uh, uh, thanks to uh, all of you, PL, Gary, Jameis, Desi, Josh. Thanks for uh, sharing uh, your, uh, your artwork and uh, your, you know, your terrible, <laughs> scary tales. <laughs> thank, yes, thank, thank you, you for having us on. A lot of fun. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Hey, uh, just before we, we sign off and, and uh, go to get this uh, video uh, online, uh, can you tell us uh, where people can find you uh, individually? Like to hang out with? <laughs> <laughs> online, websites, you know, where they can find more of your work. Um, yeah, so again, PL McMillan. Uh, I have a website, plmcmillan.com. You can also find me on Twitter and Facebook. Um, and if you're interested in reading more of my stuff, it's all on my website, as well as some free to read stuff, which is pretty fun, and a couple podcast episodes that I was featured in. Cool. Yeah, you can go to joshworstnightmare.com. You can sign up for the newsletter, and I have all my published stuff on there. And also be sure to check out denverhorror.com because we do have the newsletter, the epitaph, of which I, myself, Desi, and Jameis are co-editors. So you can kill several birds with one stone that way by signing up for the epitaph newsletter. Nice. Desi? 
Uh, you can find me on Facebook as Desi D, Twitter. I'm toying with Instagram a little. And I have a website, DesiDWriter.com, that I'm planning on re doing soon and probably adding a, some free stuff to. Nice. nice. How about you, Gary? Uh, you can find me on Twitter or uh, Facebook. I do not have a website, but uh, you can uh, Google me and a lot of my stuff will come up. Uh, otherwise, I'm just hanging out on the corner begging for money. So. <laughs> 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 it's true. I've seen them. How about you? I've seen them there. For some reason, year yeah. round, always wearing a sand outfit. <laughs> How about cool. you, Jameis? Uh, if you put in jameis.com, uh, you'll be able to find most of what I'm doing. That's J E A M U S. Also, if you do a Google search for Jameis After Midnight, uh, you'll find both my blog, the Jameis After Midnight blog, and also you'll find the Jameis After Midnight podcast, uh, the podcast that I host. Oh, fantastic. Thank, thanks so much, guys. Uh, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being so generous with your Thanks. Time. Thank you. Um, and, uh, yeah, we'll, we'll – uh, We'll be able to catch you later. Hopefully we can do this again when the, the new book comes out too, the new uh, Denver Horror Collective book. Yep. Sounds good. Excellent. <laughs> Sounds great. And thanks, uh, Sam. yeah, thank you. Uh, just real quick, uh, I want to say, uh, you know, thanks to COFO, Colorado Festival of Horror, uh, again to Denver Horror uh, Collective. Uh, you guys are always doing some amazing work, and I love working with you guys. And then uh, to our sponsors, uh, Sumner Twins uh, Talent, uh, my co-producer, uh, Stefan Santa Cruz. And, uh, yeah, everybody have a have a great night. Go go get this book, Terror at 5280 at com on Amazon. And uh, any place else, definitely go out and, and support your local uh, – Bookshop too. They they need it. This book is there. Mutiny Information Cafe is is one that comes to mind. All right. Well, right. thanks so Thank much, you. guys. Thank Have you. a good one. Fun. Thank Have you. Good. Thank you. Be kind to each other. Okay. Uh, good night.